Hello everyone, back at it again. This time we're talking about User Access Control Bypass, or UAC for short. Now, typically, the main interaction people are going to have with UAC, if you're wondering what in the world is that, is whenever you are trying to spawn something as an admin, this little pop-up pops in front of your screen, double checks, hey, are you sure you wanna run this? Here's the publisher, you can always show more details, where is it coming from, and you can hit yes. And the difference between this and a regular shell is that even if I'm running as a Vagrant user, technically, under both, and I'm part of the local admin group, on my normal user level shell on the right side here, I cannot add users to the system or do any administrative tasks such as uh, modify or delete programs in C system 32, things like that. But under our admin level shell, we can, well, if it matched the password requirements, <laughs> I might've made those a little bit too strict. And the way that we can check this is by checking our integrity level. Here we see a high integrity level for this shell versus a medium integrity level for our user shell. That's what allows us to do these kinds of things. And when attackers have a reverse shell, typically as a user, unless they get them to click on that little UAC pop-up, which they typically try not to do, but it doesn't stop everybody, right? then most of these are going to be running as a medium level shell and are not able to have full control of the device. UAC is that one barrier that's stopping an attacker from elevating from a normal user shell to an administrative shell, if the user is part of the local admin group. Now, MITRE actually has a fairly good page detailing what ransomware groups and what programs have built in UAC bypasses. Um, Bad Rabbit is a common one. Bumblebee is another one. Cobalt Strike, Cobalt Group, Empire Shells, we're going to be using that later. And a whole bunch of these have UAC bypasses built into their malware samples. This means that as part of the normal kill chain, when they are attempting to elevate their own privileges, they will perform this bypass in the background because you can't always rely on a user opening a Word document and saying, do you want to run this as admin? Well, probably not, right? Now, Font Helper, just like any other user account controlled bypass, requires that the user is a local admin. That's fairly generic. However, Font Helper also requires the UAC to be at maximum of level four which there are some UAC bypasses which bypass even level 5, but this is just for the purpose of demonstration for FOD helpers specifically. And we can see on our user access control settings that this is set to level 4, which is the default for all Windows computers. In the very short version of it is, hey, only pop up whenever I change something, versus the strictest setting, level 5, is pop up every time. And Fod Helper specifically, if we open this real quick, oop, is a little known page. And notice we can run this as administrator without a UAC pop up, which is why we're using it for an exploit. Essentially, popping open this optional features page. And the reason it knows what to populate for this optional features page is it reads a registry key every time it opens. And it'll, that registry key contains information like, hey, what keyboard are we using? What optional features are available for the installed programs? And what we're going to do is we're going to modify that registry key instead to open up command prompt. So we're going to set the registry key in the first step. The second step is opening the registry key with FOD helper at an elevated level, at admin level. And then third is we're going to delete the key and remove evidence. Now, we're going to be using our full installation of Kali this time. 
This time we're going to be using our PowerShell Empire server and client in order to establish our command and control connection. PowerShell Empire is fairly similar to Metasploit, but I would say very Windows specific. And we're going to be using a basic listener of an HTTP. Now we have a very basic staging key. We have very basic launcher, PowerShell, no profile, encoded command running on port 80 with a five second delay. Now I've already set this up quite a few days ago and we're also using a stager of a launcher batch script running in PowerShell. And I've already said this also to our listener and created this earlier. I've already pushed this file onto our Windows device. And as we can see, as soon as we launch it, it is self-deleting as it's establishing the C2 connection. And we can see that user access control is still set to level four. And notice, even on our side, nothing is popping up. There's no notification or warning that any of this is going on in the background. And if we look towards our Kali, we can see here in just a sec, we currently have no agents, but we should see this Windows device check in here in just a second. There it is. Perfect. Now we have a medium integrity shell as this vagrant user. Now, even though this is as our user shell, and even though this is a technically a local admin, this is not an admin level shell just yet because we haven't had that user access control pop up. If we try and run Mimicats, we'll get an error. Hey, this module needs to run in an elevated context. So this is where our UAC bypass comes into play. And we are going to use Font Helper. We will set our listener to our HTTP server, setting our agent to our currently logged in agent. And we will, we'll leave a basic for now. We won't do any obfuscation. We won't do any extra commands, just basics. And now the task is started and we see our new agent already checked in. Still on our Windows device, nothing is alerting our user to anything going on in the background. And likewise, if we check our agents, we can see this admin level shell, still under the same user context, now should have better permissions. So now let's try running our Mimicats and we'll see what pops up for us. Waiting about five seconds, just because I know the HTTP server, perfect. There's the results. And now we can see, hey, <laughs> we also see the password I used to connect to our network share. Very, very secure, trust me. But we also see our Vagrant users NTLM hash and our Windows 10 service accounts NTLM hash, as well as any other users on system. And just like that, we have an admin level shell established as a command and control connection on this host, performed with a UAC bypass, with the user none the wiser. Now the question becomes for detection, is this worth monitoring? Even in just the past five days over three event codes, because registry is so often fired or used, you can see even with a giant gap in between these two separate events from a couple days ago till now, when this computer is just turned off, we still have 65,000 events. And specifically for tracking registry changes, I'm using 4657. Our registry key was modified. 4660, key was deleted. And 4663, whenever something attempts to access a registry key, in our case, FOD helper, right? And the way that we can find out what key is specifically being used is by the object name, which is, as you can see, a lot of noise. But thankfully, Font Helper is actually documented quite well on GitHub. And we can see those same three steps that we mentioned earlier, the creation of the registry key under our current user, 
software classes, MS settings, shell, open, command, opening FOD helper, and removing the registry structure to delete the evidence. If we go to our search again and change our object name to, let's say, just MS settings shell open, we get what we actually care about. And we see, just pulling this open as an example, that PowerShell is what's opening this. And we don't specifically want to narrow this down and say, hey, only certain process names, right? Because malware samples could be named anything. They can even use legitimate Windows binaries like PowerShell in this case. So let's narrow this down even further, depending on the access type. Specifically, let's look to the first step where we're creating that registry structure we're going to be looking for whenever we set the key value. And we see right here that we have PowerShell setting this key value under our current user classes MS settings shell open command, just like we expect. This is under the registry and we can follow this up instead of just setting the key value. Unfortunately, we don't actually see what context it is. We don't see what the key was set to. There's a little bit of a blind spot there, but we can change the accesses to querying the key values. In other words, something is asking, hey, what is the value of this key? And we can narrow down these 15 events even further by saying, hey, only let me know when the process is legitimately FOD helper. And now we have the 10 events where FOD helper opened this same registry key. Going to the third stage, we can see where it deletes the evidence. And we're going to change our accesses one more time from a set or query event to a deletion event. And we see that followed up right afterwards. Where we have, again, the same process, PowerShell, deleting this same key. Now, if we want to, we don't even necessarily have to create a search where we have the deletion, right? Because maybe instead of deleting it, they just modify it to a value of zero. Deletion isn't necessarily part of the kill chain. So what we can do is we can combine our first two searches and say, hey, give me all the events where either FOD helper is opening this key or we're setting the key value. And now we get the nine events that we actually care about. Now, you could also make this search into a join table set where you join events from the setting key value to a short time frame after and query the key value by FOD helper. That would also be a legitimate way to go about it. But considering this search is so noisy, as you saw earlier, just these three event codes or 65,000 events on essentially just one host, then I would rather spend the time on remediation actions. And the best remediation actions we can do for this is to set the UAC always to five and to make it so that user accounts have a different account that is the administrator and their daily driver account that they use on a day-to-day -day basis, not be a local administrator. Thank you for joining me, and I hope you have a wonderful day.